The month of July is all but set to go down in history as one marked by an unprecedented number of extreme weather events, hardly a corner of the planet left untouched by the impact of climate change. Now in Asia, labelled last week by the World Meteorological Organization as the world's most disaster-prone region, the dire picture largely ricocheted between deadly floods and scorching temperatures. The latter a result of blistering heat waves sweeping the northern hemisphere shattering temperature records across Europe, the U.S. and China. Our experts describe July 2023 as globally hottest month ever. Out of the 30 hottest days on record, 21 fell to July. The mean global temperature was also at least 0.2% degrees, or rather 0.2 degrees Celsius higher than the July of just four years ago, with that month in 2019 holding the record. Now that puts it at roughly 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial average. These are increases governments have not taken lightly. Singapore launched its first heat stress advisory to help people manage the risks of heat-related illnesses. Heat stroke alerts also went full blast in Japan and China, where mercury levels soared past the 50 degrees mark, setting new national records. Now, prolonged extreme heat often spells higher precipitation because the hotter the air, the more moisture it can carry. And that was precisely what happened last month, when record monsoon rainfalls inundated last swath of Asia, in particular Japan, China, South Korea and India. The deluge in India delivering New Delhi its wettest day in July in over 40 years. Flash floods and landslides have claimed the lives of more than 100 people across the region and forced the evacuation of countless others. And that's not to mention Dok Suri, the second typhoon to make landfall in China in less than two weeks, and the most powerful to hit the country this year. It moved from the Philippines across southern Taiwan, leaving a trail of destruction in its wake. Meanwhile, across the globe, parts of the U.S. are so hot, doctors are treating patients for burnt injuries incurred from just falling on the pavements. Now, more than 5,000 records have been broken or tied in recent weeks. Some 180 million people are under heat watches and warnings. That's about half the U.S. population. Further up north, parts of Canada are quite literally on fire. Firefighters are battling more than a thousand blazes across the country, the majority of them considered out of control. At least four times as much land has been burned compared to any other season in the country since 1990. Across the Atlantic, equally ferocious wildfires are ravaging southern Europe and North Africa, with Greece suffering its worst July on record for wildfires. It's what the country's prime minister has likened to a war. The UN chief issuing a no less stark description of the climate crisis. He says no longer the era of global warming, but of global boiling. And as the list of records-breaking events threatens to grow, scientists are making clear human-induced climate change is to blame. To help us understand these extreme weather events, Jim Ski, chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and Professor of Sustainable Energy at Imperial College London, joins us live. Professor, thank you so much for joining us. What exactly is happening? July saw record-breaking heat waves as well as storms around the world. How unusual is this extreme weather? Was it expected? Yeah, our our recent uh, reports, the reports from IPCC, uh, predicted that we would see these kind of events happening. We would see more extremes, uh, they would be more intense. What I think has surprised people is just how quickly all of this has come upon us. So we were absolutely expecting this kind of direction, whether it was floods, you know, torrential rain or the heat extremes we've seen in Europe and, and the United States. But it's just happened much more quickly. I think think that's uh, the, the key message. So with the July month just passed, is this just an example of what the new normal could be in a world that's warmer by 1.5 degrees going forward? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it could be a kind of new normal. It's worthwhile saying uh, that the climate does vary from one year to another. And it does vary along the El Nino, La Nina cycle that we see in the climate. So it may be that we are a bit above a long term average, but the long term average is surely rising and will continue to rise unless we see very significant reductions in, in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, 
Our last report projected that we would uh, reach 1.5 degrees as a long-term average by around 2030, perhaps in the early, early 2030s. And it will continue to rise beyond that, even to two or even perhaps three degrees warmer than pre-industrial, unless we get a grip on emissions. Looking at the more frequent extreme weather events, are we headed for doom? Realistically, is there anything that can be done to slow down or reverse the effects of climate change? Yeah, I think it's really important. You, you know, you can uh, derive very gloomy messages from everything we're seeing, and let's not kid ourselves. This is this this is really serious. But human beings have it within their power to actually change uh, the, the, the direction of this by putting in place ambitious policies to reduce emissions. Sure, it's going to get warmer, and I think uh, we will be up to 1.5 degrees uh, you know, in, in the very near future. And But through our actions, we can kind of keep it there uh, within or around 1.5 degrees as long as we reduce emissions in a substantial way. Now, when it comes to climate action, where do you think governments have fallen short? Is there a lack of information or are there considerations that they might be having which we are not aware of? Well, I, th I think the issue, they, they are not short of information. The last IPCC report said that uh, human influence over the climate was unequivocal. Uh, the last report also pointed out that we need to get to net zero emissions in all order to avoid uh, further increases in global warming. And indeed, many governments around the world have now adopted these net zero targets for some point in the middle or the second half of the 21st century. I think the gap that you see is that the targets need to be backed up by very active and specific policies that uh, will allow emissions to fall. So I don't think it's a lack of information. Uh, the question is the kind of the processes, the debates that will take place about how exactly these emission reductions can take place. The UN estimates that we will breach the 1.5 degree target within roughly a decade. If that's our current trajectory, what can countries do to adapt? What changes can people like our viewers make? Well, I mean, the, the, there, are, there are many thing, things that can be done. Obviously, one issue that we're seeing is that it is becoming really quite problematical uh, remaining outside when you get a problem of heat and humidity. I was in Singapore, Malaysia, Cambodia, uh, you, you know, just uh, a few weeks ago, and people were very struck uh, local people by just the you know, temperature combinations that they had not seen before. So I do think it, it will involve changes to working practices. It can involve changes like the way we design our cities to allow more greenery in cities, to do allow more water courses that will help to keep temperatures down, and indeed would also help to reduce needs for energy for air conditioning. So these are just examples. And in, in the you know, sort of land and agriculture, perhaps choosing slightly different crop varieties will help people, help uh, farmers adapt to uh, the, the effects of climate change. So as well as reducing emissions, there is absolutely a big agenda for adapting to climate change. And it needs that kind of twin track. We need to get used to higher temperatures to a warmer world, but there's also a lot we can do to prevent the world getting very much warmer. Oh, many thanks for that, Professor, for your insights. Uh, we are just speaking to Jim Ski, Chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change.